plan on spending the whole year on this subject, so it's going to be uh, a little more in depth than most probably would have ventured. But I want to say that in Psalm 77, verse 13, you might, you know, say to yourself, "What good is the sanctuary? What? Why? Why should I be interested in it?" You know, as a as a church, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, um, there are certainly people who who have uh, ventured out into the sanctuary message, uh, but I don't know of anyone who's got, gone more deep than the Seventh Day Adventist denomination, and I uh, I, I value that part of of our of our pillars our doctrine because uh, it's not a doctrine it's it's more of a life <laughs> and it's uh, the foundation of who we are as, as a people of God and it's based upon biblical truths not on someone's imagination or something they found in the desert on a bunch of plates it's about the Word of God and that's why I value it so much and I think uh, the sanctuary is certainly a part of our heritage that we need to hold dear and understand in a, in a great and, and deep way. And so when you look in Psalm 77 verse 13, you say, why should I care about what the sanctuary means to me or what it has to say to me? Well, it says there, your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. If you want to know Jesus Christ, if you want to know the plan of salvation, if you want to know anything about what the word has to say to you, and how it can change your life. The word says that God's way is in the sanctuary. And um, so it is vital for our understanding. And as you see in Exodus chapter 25, uh, verse 8, God makes a command of Moses. He says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God, in his kindness, has a twofold lesson for us as his people. And certainly throughout generations, he has made this point. And that is that A, he wants us to understand the plan of salvation. He wants us to know what the plan of salvation is. And, and so if we want to have an understanding, if we want to know what it means we have to go into the word of god and embrace it and understand it and hold it dear in our hearts and so uh, i feel very strongly led to the to this year spend time on the sanctuary because it's such a valuable asset to who we are as god's people and um, not only did god want to plan this uh, or show us or, or give us an object lesson of what his plan of salvation is as it is um, imprised in the sanctuary and the temple courts and all of the things that were involved there. But there was a second reason that God wanted the sanctuary and why God wanted to um, show his people the sanctuary and the object lesson of salvation, and that was that God wanted to dwell among them. Amen? You know, when you think about Emmanuel, God with us. God's desire is to dwell with us. Would you say amen? God wants to be in our hearts. Uh, since we are the sanctuary, since Stephen made that uh, uh, stand so many centuries ago, where he went to his knees and he said, the sanctuary of God is not over there in that building, although it was at one time. Now it's right here. And so uh, certainly the idea of the sanctuary has somewhat changed, but ultimately God desires to dwell in us. And I think from the creation and fall of man to the present time, there has been a continual unfolding of the plan of salvation and God's plan to redeem us, and it's through Christ. And the entire fallen race, God wants to redeem. Not just a few, but all. Uh, you see up here in uh, these few slides I have here, 
I start, you know, Israel was in Egypt for around 430 years. And Egypt was an idolatrous nation. When Egypt started to expose itself and show itself to the world, uh, it started to go into idolatry. And um, I don't know, uh, I'm certain that God was there with his people for a long time. I don't uh, uh, understand or know or begin to know the history of if Egypt ever really was a godly nation. I don't know. We know it was a very uh, predominant nation. But it, it just amazes me um, when a nation starts to go bad, it starts to uh, idolize everything but God. And here you see uh, just a few. Uh, I, was, I thought to myself, I'm going to show them how many gods and goddesses were worshipped in Egypt because it will intimidate the common mind. It will just intimidate. And so I, I started looking through and I started researching and doing some research. And when I got over 200 gods and goddesses, I thought, I'm not going to fit this on a PowerPoint. And I actually tried. Uh, it didn't work. So I thought, well, I'll maybe list a few of them. And here you see just, just a couple of gods and goddesses that were being worshipped in Egypt. And... Uh, I'm, you know, when I was researching it, I kind of had to laugh to myself because uh, even the, the experts in the field were saying that, well, we can't really put together an organized list because there's so many and it's still evolving and so we can't really put a concrete list of how many gods and goddesses were worshipped in Egypt because the list keeps expanding as we unearth things. And so, you know, I thought, well, maybe I'll um, make a point here by just uh, putting up just a couple of the common, uh, the, uh, how would you say, the, uh, uh, the, the highest ranking gods, if you will, or uh, the most popular gods in Egypt, these are just a few. I just went through three slides and kind of tells you what they, what they uh, stood for and, and why they worship them. And uh, it seems to me uh, that they worshiped everything but God. And, and it's, it's just so sad. You know, a nation, when it starts to go down when it starts to deteriorate, it seems to uh, move to this idolatry and uh, person and uh, object worship. And, you know, you can have a definition of what's idolatry, but uh, I'm sure you have formulated in your mind what idolatry is, but you can worship just about anything. You, you could worship your wife or your husband. If, if you take it to the extent, you could worship uh, a vehicle or you could worship a pair of shoes if, if that really is in you know, your thinking. You could worship just about any kind of object there is. And certainly in Egypt, that's where they went. When the nation started to deteriorate, and we don't know how long uh, a period, I'm sure, I'm sure that, you know, there were, uh, when the exodus took place, there were many Egyptians who had accepted the Hebrew faith. And they actually, when God gave them the opportunity, they put blood over their doorposts. And they actually exodus or exited with Israel. And so certainly God's influence was there. And um, whether you believe it or not, maybe Israel had to go down to Egypt, partly because of the conditions, but also maybe God was trying to reach out to the heathen. 
he certainly gave Pharaoh enough opportunities <laughs> to repent. You know, I, once again, God is using uh, a way that is very unforeign to my thinking, and that is he's operating in a way that I don't visualize him operating in. He's going to the extent to try to convert the heart of a, of a cold-hearted leader. And so he takes 10 opportunities and sends them Pharaoh's way. And you know, this foreign thinking, you know, maybe he's trying to sh present some shock treatment. Sometimes God has to enter into a place in our lives where shock treatment is the only way that we can wake up. <laughs> Certainly that's what he was doing throughout Israel's history is trying to shock them, which goes totally against his character because God is very systematic, very methodical, very um, pointed in how he works. And he, you know, time is not like it is with us, with him. And so, you know, God's timing is perfect timing. Would you say amen? In every way. God's timing is perfect timing. But you see here that in the sanctuary, the tabernacle and the temple of God on earth, they were a pattern of the original in heaven. Uh, around the sanctuary and its solemn services um, gathered the grand truths which were to be developed through succeeding generations. Uh, it wasn't just Israel that benefited from the, uh, the understanding and the research and the study of the sanctuary message. Salvation is for all humanity, from the beginning until the end. And so God wanted us to understand it, to study it. And um, even on Sunday after the resurrection, Jesus walked with two men from Emmaus. And uh, they thought all was lost because the man they had considered was the Messiah had been put to death. Jesus was upset with them. He was very upset. At the time, the only scriptures were the Old Testament. The New Testament had not started until about 52 AD, some 21 years later. And if Christ could teach about himself and his mission and the plan of salvation from the Old Testament, then how valuable is the Old Testament to us even today? It's just as valuable. Jesus in Luke 24, verses 25 and 27 says, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, those that are slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And he began at Moses and all the prophets, and he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus taught from the Old Testament the plan of salvation. How important is the whole Bible to the Christian today? It's very important, and, and we need to know it. We need to understand it. The world is using it against us in spite of us. That shouldn't be the case. We should be the authorities of the scriptures. More than any hum, human being in the course of time, we are at the end of time. We should know what God has for us in the scriptures. We all need to keep the subject of the sanctuary in mind. Certainly, the elements and the practices aren't being practiced today, but it still behooves us to understand them because in those object lessons are the plan of salvation as God has mapped it out for us. God forbid that the clattering of words coming from human lips should lessen the belief of our people in the truth that there is a sanctuary in heaven and that a pattern of this sanctuary was once built on earth for our understanding, for our enlightenment. And God's way is in it. You see, God desires his people to become familiar with this pattern 
keeping ever before their minds the heavenly sanctuary where God is all and in all. What Jesus is doing today is crucial to our understanding. And you know, as I think about all of these gods, um, well over 200, closer to 300 gods and goddesses, I don't know about you, but I want to worship the right God. <laughs> because there are certainly, you know, you could say today, if we really think about it, there's probably more than 300 going on around being worshipped. And it's really the affection of your heart that places something over the presence of God in your life. Anything that we put between God and ourselves becomes a distraction that takes us away from his will. And we don't want that, do we? God in his loving kindness said this in Exodus 25 verse 8, God said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them because God desires to have a place in your heart. You know, a custom as they had been in Egypt to material representation of the deity and these of the most degrading nature, it was difficult for Israel to conceive of the existence of the character of the unseen one. Sometimes when we take ourselves out of God's presence, it's very difficult to recognize who he is. Sometimes when we walk away from the presence of God and pursue other things of life, it's very difficult to recognize his voice in our life, his will in our life. There's never been a time of verse history like today that we need the presence of God in our life more than ever in everything we do. I mean, do you feel comfortable making a decision without God's counsel? Do you desire to do something on your own, to be independent? of God in his counsel? I don't know of a time of earth's history unlike today, especially when we're operating in a time that we have no clue what's coming next. I hope it's not true, but I heard the other day there's other strains of this stuff coming behind it, and I hope that's not true, but if it is true, dear hearts, <laughs> it's not over yet. And we need hope more than ever today. We need Christ in our lives. We need his will to be done in our lives. We need to trust in him. We need to have our confidence. We need to be in his presence more so today than ever before in earth's history. And I don't think it's going to get any better. Something... Worse may come behind it. God forbid that. But I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Through the sacrifices and the offerings brought to the earthly sanctuary, the children of Israel were to lay hold of the merits of a Savior to come. In the wisdom of God, the particulars of this work were given to us that we might, by looking upon them, understand the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. When we study the Old Testament sanctuary, the pattern of the heavenly, it gives us an insight and it gives us understanding of what Christ is doing for you and for me today. This is why it's so crucial for us to understand. And, you know, it's, 
It's a miracle. Now, you can't read all those small words there, but I'm just showing you just uh, uh, a snapshot, an overview of what the sanctuary, its court, and the temple, the tabernacle within the court was like. You have the altar of sacrifice as you walk in through the gates. And then you have the laver, the water um, bowl where the priests washed. And then you had the tabernacle itself. And we'll talk more about that later. In Exodus 25, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God's desire was to dwell with his people. God's desire then was to dwell with them. God's desire today is to dwell with them, with us. Here in this text is the command to build a sanctuary. If you look through chapters 25 through 27, it describes exactly how Moses and the Israelites to were, build, were to build the sanctuary. If you go onward in chapter 37 through and 38 of Exodus, it describes exactly what they built. It was built exactly as they had been told by God. The sanctuary or the tabernacle in the wilderness was a model of the real one in heaven, only on a much smaller scale. And of course, when Solomon came along, he made everything big and, and fanciful. The, this was uh, a, if you will, a pattern or replica of something much smaller than what Solomon built. And just the labor alone, the bowl where they washed, Solomon made it like 40 times or 50 times larger than the original. Well, of course, the, the, the mobile one had to be uh, transported whenever God would move, you know, the fire by night and the, and the cloud by day, whenever he decided that he wanted to move to somewhere else, it would start to move. And the priests knew it was time to move. So they waited for God to decide when it was time to move, and then they moved. And so when they moved, they had to pick everything up. And, and, and we'll talk later about this, but there were certain things that they had to do in order to prepare just to move this mobile sanctuary. And uh, they were constantly replacing articles and things within it because it would wear out in the sand. You know, the sand, when the sandstorms would come, it would beat on the, on the cloth and on the uh, different elements within, and they had to continually keep it up. And it was not, not light either. The boards just to surround the tabernacle itself were quite heavy, and it took many, many hundreds of priests in order to move it. In Acts chapter 7, verse 44, it says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. In Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, it says there, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also having something to offer. For if we were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So it's important that we understand it because of what's taking place today in our behalf. You see, the holy places made with hands were to be the figures of the true. And any Christian denomination that doesn't understand this has missed the entire point of the gospel. We will only have pieces of it, and it'll be all disjointed, and it won't make sense to us. 
But as we study this, and as we come to understand it in the way God has presented it, then we will have everything we need and understand of what Christ is doing for us in the plan of salvation today. And we'll be able to share that with others. Because it's figures of the true. God presented before Moses in the mount a view of the heavenly sanctuary and commanded him to make all things according to the pattern shown. All these directions were carefully recorded by Moses who communicated them to the leaders of the people. By studying the model here on earth, we can learn about the true tabernacle in heaven and what Jesus is doing there. When someone comes to ask, we'll have an answer. It will make sense to them. Have you ever had someone come and ask you a question and you didn't quite have an answer? You know, as you study these things, it gives us, it fills in the holes. It helps us to better understand and communicate the gospel. And people will have an interest in it. If we can communicate it in a way that God has presented it. That's why I believe that in Psalm 77, verse 13, it says, Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. And that's why it's so important for us to understand. You know, um, when you look at the layout, and this is kind of a, a rough draft um, of the ancient Israel's wilderness camp after they left Egypt, God is a God of order, isn't he? Isn't that beautiful? That's a beautiful sight right there. Uh, you have the 12 tribes of Israel all tented, all laid out in their family uh, communities, you know. Um, I read an article the other day. It said that America is becoming tribal. Tribalism is alive in America. And I, I didn't understand that. And then I thought about the sanctuary. I said, tribalism, okay. <laughs> the 12 tribes. Uh, each has their own little turf there. Uh, God presented it in a way. Uh, in the center was the tabernacle. And all of its beauty, God was at the center of their life, of their community. Is God the center of your life and community, your family? Is God the center? You see, that's what the sanctuary shows us, is that God, as the people were laid out and the communities were established, God was in the midst. He was at the center of their life. Of all of their transactions, of all of their history, of everything, God was the center. He wasn't on the outside looking in. He was dead center of their life, of their community, of their heart. He wanted to be in the midst of them at the center. God wants to be in the center of your heart. He wants to have your affections. God is an intimate God, isn't he? He cares deeply. He has feelings. He cares about you. He cares about your family. He cares about what's going on. He, 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 he cares about your community around you, whether it be your neighborhood or whatever, wherever you live. There's something else here that I think is very important, and that is when you see the tabernacle, they were instructed that they shouldn't tent within seven-tenths of a mile from the border of the temple courts. No one could get, no one could place a tent within 0.7 of a mile or seven-tenths of a mile. No one could get any closer than seven-tenths of a mile from around the tabernacle, around the court. You see... It was a sacred place. 
It's very important. You see, where God is present is a sacred place. Do you remember when Moses was up on the mount and what God tell him to do? The burning bush there, what did God say? Take off your sandals. Why? Now I'm going to get a little um, outside the box here. Maybe what we should do is have a shoe rack at the entryway of the doorway here and all of us take our shoes off when we come into the presence of God. You know they do that in a, in a mosque. When you go into a mosque, you take your sandals off. You take your shoes off when you enter into the, into the uh, mosque. I'm being a little bit, you know, but we track in our dirt into the sanctuary, into the presence of God. Whenever I go into somebody's house, I take my shoes off, and they say, ah, oh, you don't have to take it. Well, this is your home. It's a, it's a, it's a special place, right? Ma takes a lot of time cleaning the carpets and making sure everything's just right. I, I'm going to take my shoes off. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should take our shoes off in the sanctuary because I'll probably get in trouble. But just the thought process, it, we are in the presence of God. How sacred, how important do we feel when we're in the presence of God? Is it important to us? Does it matter? Do we feel this is a sacred place? Do we feel like God's presence is here? Because that's certainly the idea that God is presenting in the way that he mapped out the community of Israel in that time when they left Egypt and he was at the center of their life. How much more should God be the center of our life today? You know, I really think that by studying the Word of God and by praying and spending time with God, I believe that His people will be elevated above the common. They will stand out in a wicked society. They will look differently. They will act differently. They will sound differently. By t spending time with God, placing Him at the center of our life, we will be different. People will recognize that we have spent time with God and there's something different about them. They'll take a special interest in getting to know them because they are different. And by spending time with God, by studying His Word, by praying, I believe that we will be elevated above common and will be recognized as the people of God. Our faith will go with us. God's presence will be with us. We will not be common. He will make a difference in our lives and He will change the way we act, the way we think, the way we talk, the way we emulate His presence. That God will be with us and we will be different. We will no longer be common. And I'm not trying to use that in a derogatory way. I'm just saying that when Israel camped in the wilderness, anybody that came upon their camp had to recognize that these people were different. There is something about them I've got to know.
God longs to be present with us. God longs for us to know and understand the plan of salvation because He is the one who mapped it out. He is the one who created it. And He wants us to be different. He wants us to know Him and to spend time with Him because He longs to be present with us. You know, I think about special friends that I visit, especially family. Um, sometimes I just can't wait to get there. You know, it's, it's such a happy occasion. It's such an enjoyable time. Um, I can't fathom a God who desires to be with me. I can't fathom a God who is anxious and excited to spend time with me. But yet that's the God we serve. He wants desperately to spend time with you and with me. What a God we serve. When we think about God's love for us, I pray more than ever it's good thoughts. Thoughts of a God who desires to be close to us. To know every little thing, every little detail, even though he already does. Isn't it nice to know that he desires to know every little thing? Have you ever thought of it that way? It's not the fact that he knows everything. He has the desire to know every little detail of your life. God loves you. He loves me. And he longs to be present with us in the center of our life. That's the kind of God I want to serve. That's the, one, that's the kind of God I want to die for. Not to be presumptuous like Peter, but I want to live for him. Even if it means dying for him, may he see me through that. But that's the kind of God I want to serve. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. 